Greetings, it is I, Tantus Narodan Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome. It is time to continue our discussion on 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, 5th edition D&D. Today I'm going to do some stuff that's going to involve you Dungeon Masters out there. So it's really important for you, and you players out there, you might want to hear about it a little bit too, because someday... You might want to be a dungeon master. Today I'm diving into monsters. I'm going to be talking about the basics of understanding what's in the monster manual. This will help you when reading any printed information based upon a monster. It will tell you about the entries. I'm going to explain what the entries mean so you can read them, understand them, and use them in your games. So let's talk about what the monster manual represents. First off, it's a tool for dungeon masters. You as a player could read through it just for fun, for entertainment, to know about monsters. You don't want to memorize it because A, that's really difficult to do anyway, and B, you don't need to. You don't need to know everything about these monsters. Your character more than likely will not know everything about these monsters. So why would you as a player need to know everything about them? It's cool to read through them, but it's really a primary tool for your DM to use. The book is made in such a way that's filled with easy to use, easy to play with uh, creatures of all levels that a DM can use in their game. Now, a monster is actually just defined as a creature that the players will interact with. That means they can be very broad. Oftentimes, they're going to have to fight and possibly kill these creatures. But this also means that monsters don't only have to be enemies. They can be benevolent. They could just be randomly violent. They could be things that would be very treacherous and plan against the PCs. It's a very broad term when we're talking monsters. And there are plenty of things which would be considered monsters, but your characters will more than likely never fight because at most they would probably get along with it if it was in the game. Or at least attempt to make peace with it if it's, such a, if it's a good or benevolent creature. So there's a lot of different terrains that monsters can take, can be in, and most of the time they are divided up in between these different terrains. So when you look at a monster's entry, it will mention the type of terrains you could find it in. You could find it in a dungeon. A dungeon is any enclosed area that players would explore. Now this can be anything from a wizard's tower to an, an actual literal dungeon. More that often than not, most of these tend to be underground or at least below whatever is considered the surface at the time, whether in the mountain or not. And many of the times they are man-made structures. Dungeon is a very broad term though, and as I said, it's not the kind of dungeon you'd think about like a medieval dungeon. It's a more common term mentioning the structures that a, G a DM will write up for people to explore. Now, there are other places that monsters appear. They appear in the Underdark. The Underdark, you think of it as one gigantic dungeon that spreads across the entire landscape underground. It is complete darkness, utter darkness. A lot of savage monster races live there. Some of them less savage than others, but many of them also very cruel and vicious. It's a very dark, scary place that PCs can explore, and there are plenty of monsters there. There's, of course, the wilderness in general. This is mountains, swamps, plains, forests, deserts, any kind of natural wilderness terrain, you will find creatures there. There's going to be natives to that area. Now, you can have urban areas, towns and cities. You can have creatures that are living in urban areas. Now, this sometimes might not be things you'd think about. It could be the pet of some kind of rich, exclusive person or something that's moved into the sewers. But monsters appear in cities too. There's also underwater, ocean or lake-based adventures or any kind of water-based adventures where PCs will perhaps be underwater for periods of time or involved with water. There's gonna be water-based creatures. For example, there's things like a kraken, which is a giant squid monster. It lives in the water. It has to be in the water. You could also fight a shark. A shark would count in a monster in this case because you're fighting it and battling with it. And it's a creature, but of course it's more of a natural thing, but it would be something you're fighting in the water. Now the last area that I really want to mention is the other planes. I briefly mentioned them at the end of the last episode. The other planes, especially the outer planes, have their own sets of creatures. For example, if you're in the Abyss or the Nine Hells, you're going to be fighting fiends there because that's their natural habitat. So let's start talking about the stats of the monsters. I'm not going to finish it today, but I'm going to get through part of the stats and I will finish it in the next episode and finish up this book. But anyway, let's start talking about them. First thing we're going to look at is the the size of the creature. The size is between tiny and gargantuan and it lists the space it takes up on a grid board that you might be using for your game. Of course a grid board would be a board of squares that each square represents a 5 by 5 foot square. 
Now, it'll tell you how much of this space it takes up. It'll give you a couple examples of creatures of that appropriate size. After size, we begin talking about the types of creatures. First off, there's aberrations. Aberrations are often very alien, sort of strange creatures from very unusual origins that sort of exist in the world, things like abolists and beholders. There's beasts. Beasts are your more natural creatures. Those would be things like animals and dinosaurs. They seem to have a natural place in this world more than anything. Sometimes they have mystical abilities, like things like an owlbear would be in this section, but oftentimes they do not. Then there's celestials. Celestials are traditionally good creatures. They're going to be creatures from, like, Celestia or other similar places. They have their own sets of rules, and oftentimes you might not be good enough for them. You never know. There's constructs. They're sort of cr animated creatures of natural materials. They can be built of wood, stone, metal, flesh even sometimes. They're creatures that are built together from all these materials and given life through magic. Constructs are... Fairly unnatural in that way, but they're not, even if they're sort of built out of flesh, they're not animated flesh, being that they are zombies or undead or something, which I'll mention in a minute. They're more animated through the magic, making them a puppet, almost. Dragons. I don't have to say a lot about dragons. They're exactly what you think about. They, Some of them breathe fire, some of them breathe other elements. They're big, mean, most of them, so a bunch of them are evil, some of them can be good. They all hoard treasure. There's the elementals. Creatures built out of a specific element, fire, water, air, earth, they can be as simple as just being a being exactly made out of that, or some of them are more complex and they can still count as elementals, almost seemingly having form and structure. Others don't. Now there's the fae. The fae are beings of the wild, beings of nature. They're kind of the spirits of nature you think of them almost as, sprites, pixies, satyrs. There's fiends, the creatures from the Abyss and Nine Hell, which I mentioned. Creatures that are the epitome of the evils of the realm they are from. Then there are giants. Giants are pretty much just large people. It's not easy to think about us. They're much bigger than us. They are massive. You think of like the giant from Jack and the Beanstalk, that sort of thing, except they don't live up in clouds. They live on the ground next to you. you some of them are benevolent, others not so much. There's humanoids. That's anything like humans, elves, dwarfs, dragonborn, gnomes. They count as humanoids. It's the basic type of creature that you ex encounter in the world that's going to be friendly with you. There are, of course, unfriendly humanoids such as orcs or goblins, but there are many humanoid races you can get along with. Then there's monstrosities. Monstrosities are massive sort of monstrous creatures that are very dangerous and you don't understand often have magical or strange origins they're not sort of alien like the aberrations are they're more almost seem like they could be natural but they just don't quite fit in very 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 monstrous creatures hence their name then there are oozes Creatures that almost seem like living water or living jello. Think of the blob from the movie. That would be an ooze. It would act a lot like the blob from any of the versions of the movie you want to see. It kind of slimes around consuming things like that, consuming people. That's an ooze. There's plants. These oftentimes refer to plants that are more mobile or even have some level of sentience. It would be like, I'm not just fighting a tree. I'm maybe fighting a treant. Uh, some the tree people, um, or I could be fighting a shambling mound, which is basically a rotting pile of garbage that's kind of animated with limited intelligence. And then there is undead. This is your skeletons, zombies, vampires. There's a whole listing of undead. These are things that have been either raised through necromancy to life again, but not quite the life you know about, or through the own malicious acts of the other undead have been created more of their own kind. Oftentimes, also, horrible deaths and bad things happening can cause undead to rise on their own, too. But that's um, it's sort of like a ghost haunting a place would be a type of undead. Ghosts are a type of undead. Now let's move on and talk about more things a monster has. A monster has alignment. It'll tell you the kind of a basic a kind of alignment a monster will have. Now, this is not going to be the same for every version of that monster. Just as people are individuals, monsters can be different, too. This is just the general what the race kind of aims towards, what the entire group of these monsters generally is when you encounter them. So you can sort of assume this. Then there's AC. Everything like players, monsters have AC. Now we'll list if they're wearing any kind of armor or using any kind of shields 
under their under their AC. Most of the time, you're just going to assume it's the basic stats that they have. It also, will include talking about any natural armor they have if they have like tough scales or hardened skin. Now, just like you, monsters have hit points. They have hit dice. Hit dice depends on the size of the monster. The bigger the monster, the larger the die. The smaller the monster, the smaller the die. So effectively, smaller monsters have smaller hit die, but and, and therefore get smaller hit points to larger monsters, which have larger hit dice and more hit points. They give the averages for this too, but you consider that whatever size it is going to tell you what kind of hit dice it's going to have, such as like a fighter has a D10 or a cleric has a D8. Monsters have that too, except it's based on their size. Now, monsters will have speed. This is just not the speed that a normal, normal player might have. It's the exact same. They would have a speed. It's how much they can move in a turn. But monsters can have other types of speed. There's burrowing, or digging through the earth, or rock. There's climbing, being able to climb up walls at a certain speed without having to make checks. There's flying. You can fly. It's as simple as that. You have wings or some other kind of magical ability that allows you to float in the air. There's also swimming. I'd be like a shark knows how to swim or a fish knows how to swim that a person might not know how to do. A person might have the skill to do it or have the ability with their athletics, but they're not naturally inclined to do it, such as what a shark would do. Now, just like you, your player, all monsters have ability scores. This will give you the basic information of any modifiers they have that you need to know about. Monsters also have saves. A monster's entry will tell you if they're proficient in any specific saves. Otherwise, you consider that they just get the basic saves from their ability scores. If you're looking at their proficiency, the chart based on their CR tells you in the book how much proficiency they have. So it's based upon their actual CR, their challenge rating. Now, monsters might have skills. It will list them in the book. Monsters might also have vulnerabilities, resistance, and immunities. Vulnerabilities means they take extra damage for something. That means they would take 50% more damage. Resistance means they take 50% less damage from something. Immunities means it does not affect them whatsoever. These are very similar to somewhat, what players can receive, except players tend not to receive weaknesses. At most, a player might get some resistances, maybe an immunity, but monsters themselves get these too. And the immunities might not just be from a type of damage, it also could be from certain conditions that they might have immunity to. Now, next we want to talk about a monster's senses. This is how much, this is what kind of other ways it can see you other than just perceiving you. This can be anything from dark vision, which, you know, mon p players can get dark vision too. It could be blind sight. That means they can see you without having eyes. It could be tremor sense, meaning they could sense anything that's touching the ground, or it could be true sight, which is a special ability that they can basically see everything. They pierce through illusions, through trickery. They just see things. They, it, in perfect darkness, they would see normally. It would have no limits. True sight is probably the best sense there is, but of course it's also the, one of the rarer ones. Now, the Monster Manual will let you know any languages the creature speaks. Also, it will let you know if it's telepathic. They can speak with its mind to another creature's mind, if they can speak between minds. This would be telepathy between a monster and a player could occur, that sort of thing, or between monsters and each other. Telepathy is a sort of mind-to-mind -mind connection. Now let's talk about challenge rating, because all monsters will have a challenge rating. A challenge rating tells you the level of a group of four players that should be able to take on this monster when they're well rested and that none of the players should die. So if it's a challenge rating four, I can have four level four players be able to take on this monster if they're at least well rested, ready for battle, you know, they've gotten all their abilities and they should have no other players die to it. Now challenge rating could be zero. This means something is effectively harmless. It could be below one too. This means it's slightly less than harmless also, but when it gets down to zero, it means it doesn't do anything. Now, if it should be a nearly harmless thing and there's a billion of them and you're fighting them all at once and maybe they have some kind of attack they could barely damage you with, you could get like 10 experience for killing all of them. Zero challenge ratings are not supposed to be a challenge. Now, there are challenge ratings above 20. These required sort of plans and skills and items that you might need to find in order for a player of the normal levels to defeat. The book doesn't talk about going up into levels about above 20. This is something that has been in previous editions. It, whether it will be in 5th edition or not, I don't know. But for now, don't think about that. Think about that when your level 20 characters might want to take on a CR 30, they're going to either have to come up with some kind of artifact weapon or some kind of really awesome plan if they want to succeed at that and not all die. Now, the amount of experience players get for killing a creature is based upon its challenge rating. In the book, it lists their chart telling you the amount of experience each challenge rating will grant your players. I'll get more into talking about experience when I talk about GMing, but you just have to know this is the amount that the 
players will get. Now, also monsters will have special abilities. These can range from any number of things, but there are three I do want to mention. There's innate spell casting, which effectively means that there's spell casting ingrained into the creature that they aren't trained at being a spell caster, but just have spells they can do for being that creature. There's also actual spell casting. I could be a creature that has trained specifically as part of being this creature to be a sorcerer. So I'm not only this monster, I'm also a sorcerer at the same time just because of my general training and age. That part of being in this race means learning to be a sorcerer. There's also psionics, which is a kind of psychic mind-based powers that creatures could have. And they would this is it's similar to spell casting, except it has a very different flair to it for one thing, and it has an entirely different set of powers. Okay, that's it for this time. I've gone over some of the basics of monsters. I talked a little bit about the type, uh, some of the stats for the monsters, about choosing monsters. I talked about type, size, basic statistics, CR, those sort of things. I'll talk about the rest of what's on a, a monster's stat block next time. If you have any questions, comments, anything you want to say, anything you think I left out, please leave in the comments below. Please like this video. It shows your support of the channel, the empire, the work I do. Please subscribe if you already haven't. We're always looking for more citizens, members, more citizens. And please share this video. If you know anyone that would just learn anything from this video or would just enjoy it, please share it with them. And until the next time, I bid you farewell.